Section 20 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise 4, Chapters 27 through 30. Chapter 27. We have sufficiently inspected and considered the section of the text which sets forth the probity which the noble soul furnishes to manhood, wherefore it seems right to turn to the third part which begins, and in old age, wherein the text purposes to show those things which the noble nature reveals, and must have in the third period, to wit, old age. And it says that the noble soul in age is prudent, is just, is open-handed, and rejoices to tell of the goodness and excellence of others, and to hear of it, that is to say, is affable and truly these four virtues are most fitting to this age and to perceive this be it known that as tully says in that of old age our life has a fixed course and a simple path that of our right nature and in every part of our life place is given for certain things wherefore just as that is given to adolescence as said above whereby we may come to perfection and maturity so too is given to manhood that perfection and maturity themselves so that the sweetness of its fruit may be profitable to itself and to others for as aristotle says man is a civic animal wherefore he is required not only to be useful to himself but also to others and so we read of cato that he did not think of himself as born for himself but for his country and for all the world wherefore after our own proper perfection which is acquired in manhood that perfection should also come about which enlightens not only ourselves but others and man should open out like a rose that can no longer keep closed and should spread abroad the perfume which has been generated within and this should come about in that third period of life with which we are dealing it is fitting then to be prudent that is wise and to be so demands a good memory of things formerly seen and a good knowledge of things present and good foresight of things to come and as the philosopher says in the sixth of the ethics it is impossible for a man to be wise unless he is good and therefore a man is not to be called wise who proceeds by stratagems and deceits but he is to be called astute for as no one would call a man who had skill to strike the point of a knife into the pupil of the eye wise, so neither is he to be called wise who hath skill to do some evil thing, doing the which he ever injureth himself ere he injures another. If it be rightly considered from prudence come good counsels which lead the man himself and others to a right goal of human affairs and doings. And this is that gift which Solomon, when he saw himself set to govern the people, required of God, as is written in the third book of Kings and a prudent man such as this waiteth not till some one saith to him give me counsel but himself foreseeing without being requested he giveth him counsel like to the rose which not only giveth its perfume to him who cometh to it that he may have it but also to every one who passeth it by here some physician or legist may say that i am to carry my counsel and to give it even to those that ask it not and pluck no fruit of my art i answer as our lord saith I receive freely if it hath been freely given i say then sir legist that those counsels which have not respect to thy art and which proceed only from that good wit which god gave thee and this is the prudence whereof we are now discoursing thou shouldst not sell to the children of him who gave it thee those which have respect to the art which thou hast purchased these thou mayest sell yet not so but that it is fitting from time to time to pay tithes and give to god that is to those poor who have not left save the divine grace it behoves this period of life also to be just so that its judgments and its authority may be a light and a law to others and because this singular virtue to wit justice was seen by the ancient philosophers to be revealed perfectly in this period of life they committed the guidance of the city to those who had reached this age and therefore the college of the rulers was called the senate o oh, my wretched wretched country what pity for thee constrains me whensoever i read whensoever i write of aught that hath respect to civil government but since justice will be dealt with in the last treatise but one of this volume let it suffice at present to have touched this little upon it it is also meet for this period of life to be generous because a thing is most in season when it satisfies the due of its nature nor can the due of generosity ever be so satisfied as at this period of life for if we would rightly consider how aristotle proceeds in the fourth of the ethics and tully in that of offices generosity must be in such time and place that the generous man injure not either himself or others which thing may not be without prudence and without justice which to have in perfection by the natural way before this age is impossible 
ah ye ill-starred and ill-born who disinherit widows and wards who snatch from the most helpless who rob and seize the rights of others and therefrom prepare feasts make gifts of horses and arms robes and money wear gorgeous apparel build marvellous edifices and believe yourself to be doing generously and what else is this than to take the cloth from the altar and cover therewith the robber and his table no otherwise ye tyrants should your presence be scoffed at than the robber who should invite his guests to his house and should set upon the table the napkin he had stolen from the altar with the ecclesiastical signs yet on it and should suppose that no one would perceive it hearken ye stubborn ones to what tully saith against you in the book of offices verily there may be many who desiring to be conspicuous and famous take from these to give to those thinking to be held in esteem if they make folk wealthy by what means soever but this is so counter to what ought to be that naught is more further it becomes this period of life to be affable that is to love to speak of good and to hear of it because it is well to speak good on those occasions when it will be hearkened to and this period of life carries a shade of authority whereby it seems that men hearken more to it than to any earlier age and it seems that it ought to have more beautiful and fair news because of its long experience of life wherefore tully says in that of old age in the person of the ancient cato upon me has grown both the desire and the enjoyment of conversation beyond what was my wont and that all these four things are fitting to this period of life ovid instructs us in the seventh of the metamorphoses in the story where he tells how cephalus of athens came to king achus for help in the war that athens was waging with crete he shows that old achus was prudent when having lost by pestilence through corruption of the air almost all his people he wisely had recourse to god and asked from him the restoration of his dead people and by his wit which held him to patience and made him turn to god his people were restored to him greater than before he shows that he was just when he says that he made partition to his new people and divided his desolated land he shows that he was generous when he said to cephalus after his request for aid o athens ask not help from me but take it and consider not the forces which this island holds and all this state of my possessions yours doubtfully we lack not power nay we have superfluity and the foe is mighty and the time for giving is right prosperous and without excuse ah how many things are to note in this answer but for one with a good understanding it is enough that it be set down here just as ovid sets it down he shows that he was affable when he carefully tells and rehearses to cephalus in a long discourse the story of the plague of his people and the restoration of them wherefore it is manifest enough that four things are suitable to this age because the noble nature manifests them in it as the text says and that the example which has been spoken of may be the more memorable he says of king achus that he was the father of telamon or peleus and of phocus of which telamon sprang ajax and of peleus achilles chapter twenty eight after the section now discoursed upon we are to proceed to the last that is to the one which begins then in the fourth term of life whereby the text purposes to manifest that which the noble soul doth in her last age to wit decrepitude and it says that she does two things the one that she returns to god as to that port whence she departed when she came to enter upon the sea of this life the other is that she blesseth the voyage that she hath made because it hath been straight and good and without the bitterness of tempest and here be it known that as tully says in that of old age natural death is as it were our port and rest from our long voyage and even as the good sailor when he draws near to the port lowers his sails and gently with mild impulse enters into it so ought we to lower the sails of our worldly activities and turn to god with all our purpose and heart so that we may come to that port with all sweetness and with all peace and herein we have a noteworthy instruction in gentleness from our own nature for at such an age death is not pain nor any bitterness but as a ripe apple lightly and without violence drops from its branch so our soul without pain parts from the body wherein it has been whence aristotle in that of youth and age says that the death that takes place in old age hath no sadness and as to him who cometh from a long journey ere he enter the gate of his city the citizens thereof come forth to meet him so come and so should come to meet the noble soul those citizens of the eternal life and this they bring about by their good deeds and contemplations for when the soul has already been surrendered to god and abstracted from the affairs and thoughts of the world it seems to see those whom it believes to be with god hearken what tully says in the person of the ancient cato i lift up myself in the utmost yearning to see your fathers whom i loved and not only them but also those of whom i have heard speak 
the noble soul then surrenders herself to god in this period and awaits the end of this life with great longing and seems to herself to be leaving and hostile and returning to her own house seems to be coming back from a journey and returning to her own city seems to be coming from the sea and returning to the port o wretched and vile who with hoisted sails rush into this port and where ye ought to rest shatter yourselves in the full strength of the wind and lose yourselves in the very place to which you have made so long a voyage verily the knight lancelot would not enter there with hoisted sails nor our most noble latin guido of montefeltro in truth these noble ones lowered the sails of the activities of the world for in their advanced age they gave themselves to religious orders putting aside every mundane delight and activity and no one can excuse himself by the tie of marriage which holds him in advanced age for not only they turn to a religious order who liken themselves in garment and in life to saint benedict and to saint augustine and to saint francis and to saint dominic but also to a good and true religious order may they also turn who abide in matrimony for god would have naught of us in religion save the heart and therefore saint paul says to the romans not he is a jew who is so outwardly nor is that circumcision which is manifested in the flesh but he is a jew who is so in secret and circumcision of the heart in spirit not in letter is circumcision the praise whereof is not from men but from god and further the noble soul at this age blesses the times past and well may she bless them because turning back her memory through them she is mindful of her righteous doings without which she could not come to the port whereto she is drawing nigh with so great wealth nor with so great pain and she doth as the good merchant when as he draweth nigh to the port he examineth how he hath prospered and saith had i not passed by such a way this treasure i should not have nor should i have wherewith to rejoice in my city to which i am drawing nigh and therefore he blesseth the way that he hath made and that these two things are suitable for this period of life the great poet lucan figures forth to us in the second of his pharsalia when he says that marcia returned to cato and begged him again and prayed that he would take her back again by which marcia is understood the noble soul and we may thus convert the figure to the truth marcia was a virgin and in that state she signifies adolescence then she came to cato and in that state she signifies manhood then she produced a son by which are signified those virtues which are declared above to be fitting in the prime of life and she departed from cato and married hortensius whereby it is signified that the prime of life departs and old age comes she bore sons also to him whereby are signified the virtues which are declared above to be fitting in old age hortensius died whereby is signified the end of old age and marcia having become a widow by which widowhood is signified decrepitude returned at the beginning of her widowhood to cato whereby is signified that the noble soul at the beginning of decrepitude returns to god and what earthly man was more worthy to signify god than cato verily none and what says marcia to cato whilst blood was in me that is prime manhood whilst the maternal power was in me that is to say age for she is in truth the mother of those other virtues as has been said above i said marcia did and accomplished all thy commands that is to say that the soul abode with constancy in the civic activities she says i took two husbands that is i have been fruitful in two ages now says marcia that my womb is wearied and i am exhausted for bearing offspring to thee i return no longer being such as may be given to another spouse that is to say that the noble soul knowing that she has no longer any womb for fruit that is to say when her members feel that they have come to feeble state returns to god who hath no need of the corporeal members and marcia says grant me the treaties of the ancient couch give me the name only of marriage which is to say that noble soul saith to god now give me repose o my lord she saith grant me at least that in this so much life as remaineth i may be called thine and marcia saith two reasons move me to say this the one is that it may be said after me that i died as cato's wife the other is that it may be said after me that thou didst not expel me but didst give me in marriage of good heart by these two reasons the noble soul is moved and desireth to depart from this life as the spouse of god and desireth to show that god was gracious to his creature o wretched and ill-born who prefer to depart from this life under the title of hortensius rather than of cato with whose name it is well to end that which it behoves us to discourse concerning the tokens of nobility because in him nobility itself shows all its tokens in every age chapter twenty nine now that the text has been expounded as also those tokens which appear in the noble man in every age whereby he may be recognized and without which he may not be any more than the sun can be without light or fire without heat the text at the end of all that has been related about nobleness cries out against the people that saith o ye who have hearkened to me see now how many be thus deceived 
to wit those who believe themselves to be noble because they are of famous and ancient generations and descended from excellent fathers though they have no nobleness in themselves and here rise two questions whereto at the end of this treatise it is well to give heed sir manfred de vico who has now the titles of praetor and prefect might say whatsoever i may be i call to men's minds and represent my ancestors who by their nobleness earned the office of the prefecture earned to set their hands to the crowning of the empire earned the reception of the rose from the roman pastor therefore i ought to receive honor and reverence from the people and this is the one question the other is that he of san nazaro of pavia and he of the piscicelli of naples might say if nobleness were that which hath been said to wit a divine seed graciously placed in the human soul and if no progeny or race hath a soul as is manifest no progeny or race could be called noble and this is counter to the opinion of those who say that our families are the most noble in their cities to the first question juvenal answers in the eighth satire when he begins as it were to exclaim what avail these honors which remain from them of old if he who would fain mantle him therein liveth ill if he who discourses of his ancestors and sets forth their great and marvellous deeds is intent on wretched and vile doings and yet says the same satirist who will call him noble because of his good family who is himself unworthy of his good family this is no other than to call a dwarf a giant then afterwards he says to such an one between thee and a statue made in memory of thy ancestor there is naught to choose save that its head is marble and thine is alive but herein speaking with submission i agree not with the poet for the statue of marble or of wood or of metal left as a memorial of some worthy man differeth much in its effect from its unworthy descendant because the statue never confirms the good opinion in those who have heard the fair fame of him whose statue is and begets it in others whereas the worthless son or grandson does just the reverse for he weakens the opinion of those who have heard good of his ancestry for a thought will come to them and say it may not be all that which is said of this man's ancestors is true since we see such a plant of their sowing wherefore he should receive not honour but dishonour who beareth ill witness of the good and therefore tully saith that the son of the worthy man should strive to bear good witness of his father wherefore in my judgment even as he who defames a worthy man deserves to be shunned by folk and not hearkened to so the vile man descended from worthy ancestors deserves to be expelled by all and the good man should shut his eyes so as not to look upon his reproach which reproaches the goodness that remains only in memory and let this suffice for the present for the first question which was mooted to the second question may be answered that a family in itself hath not a soul and yet it is true that it is called noble and in a certain sense so it is wherefore be it known that every whole is composed of its parts and there are some wholes which have one simple essence together with their parts as in one man there is one essence of the whole and of each of its parts and what is said to exist in the part is said in the same sense to exist in the whole there are other wholes which have not a common essence with their parts like a heap of grain the essence of such is secondary resulting from many grains which have true and primary essence in themselves and the qualities of the parts are said to exist in such a whole in the same secondary sense in which it has an essence wherefore a heap is called white because the grains whereof the heap is composed are white in truth this whiteness is rather in the grains primarily and comes out as the result in the whole heap secondarily and thus in a secondary sense it may be called white and it is in this sense that a family or a race can be called noble wherefore be it known that as the white grains must preponderate to make a white heap so to make a noble race the noble persons must preponderate in it i say preponderate that is exceed in number so that their goodness by its fame may overshadow and conceal the contrary which is in it and just as from a white heap of grain you might remove the wheat grain by grain and grain by grain substitute red millet till the whole heap at last would change its color so out of a noble race the good might die one by one and worthless be born into it until it should change its name and should not deserve to be called noble but base and let this suffice as answer to the second question chapter thirty as is set forth above in the third chapter of this treatise this ode has three chief parts wherefore since two of them have been discoursed upon whereof the first begins in the aforesaid chapter and the second in the sixteenth so that the first is completed in thirteen the second in fourteen chapters not counting the proem of the treatise on the ode which is comprised in two chapters we are now in this thirtieth and last chapter to discuss briefly the third chief division which was composed as the tornada of this ode for a kind of adornment in which begins against the erring ones take thou thy way my ode and here 
to begin with be it known that every good workman on the completion of his work should ennoble and beautify it as much as he may that it may leave his hands the more noted and the more precious and this it is my purpose to do here in this section not that i am a good workman but that i aspire after being such i say then against the erring ones and the rest this against the erring ones etc is a whole section and it is the name of this ode chosen after the example of the good brother thomas of aquino who gave the name against the gentiles to a book of his which he made to the confusion of all those who depart from our faith i say then take thou thy way as though i should say thou art now complete for it is time no longer to stand still but to go for thy emprise is great and when thou shalt be in the region where our lady is tell her thy business where it be noted that as saith our lord pearls must not be cast before swine because it does them no good and is lost to the pearls and as saith the poet aesop in the first fable a grain of corn is more profit to a cock than a pearl and therefore he leaves the one and picks up the other and considering this i caution and command the ode to reveal its business where this lady to wit philosophy shall be found and there shall this most noble lady be found where her treasure house is to be found to wit the soul wherein she harbors and this philosophy not only harbors in the sages but also as was shown above in another treatise wherever the love of her harbors and to such i tell my ode to reveal its business because to them its teaching will be profitable and by them it will be received and i say to it declare to this lady i go discoursing of a friend of thine truly nobility is a friend of hers for so much doth the one love the other that nobleness ever demands her and philosophy turns not her most sweet regards in any other direction oh how great and beauteous adornment is this which at the end of this ode is given to her calling her the friend of her whose true abode is in the most secret place of the divine mind end of section twenty